This is my review of the Monport Onyx 55 watt CO2 laser machine. This video is for anyone considering the Onyx or just generally in the market for a new laser cutter slash engraver. I'm using this state of the art replica as a prop for this video because the Onyx that Monport sent me is in my garage and it's 115 degrees here in Phoenix. Y'all don't wanna see how sweaty I'd be if I filmed out there, so I made this to point at. With that out of the way, let's start with a quick overview of laser technology and why you might want a CO2 laser. A decade ago, a hobbyist purchasing a laser machine would likely be looking at CO2 lasers. But diode lasers have become a lot more powerful in recent years, and they're a really good option. They're so good that it sure seems like most hobbyists are going for diode lasers. That makes sense because they're often more affordable. That's definitely true of the lower power diode lasers, like 20 watts or less, and it's often true for the more powerful diode lasers too. The cost is lower because a diode laser machine is a lot easier to construct than a CO2 laser machine. You can just slap a diode laser module on a basic motion system and call it a day, while CO2 laser tubes are large and require a system of mirrors to get the beam to the material, plus they need water cooling. So why would you want a CO2 laser if diode lasers are more common and less expensive? The answer is wavelengths, the things that light is made of. Or to put it in more utilitarian terms, to work with different materials. For a laser to engrave or cut material, the material needs to absorb the energy from the laser beam. If the material is like a mirror and simply reflects the beam, it won't absorb any of the energy and you won't even leave a mark. But materials don't absorb and reflect all wavelengths equally. An actual mirror reflects all visible light, a glass window lets all visible light pass through, and something like black felt absorbs almost all of the visible light. Those properties are very important when it comes to laser performance. Diode lasers emit a different wavelength than CO2 lasers, so they perform differently depending on the material. Most CO2 lasers have a wavelength of 10,600 nanometers, which is in the infrared range and getting fairly close to the microwave range. You can't even see a CO2 laser's beam with the naked eye, but to be clear, you shouldn't be shining any laser beam into your naked eye <laughs> anyway. Most hobbyist diode lasers have a wavelength of around 455 nanometers, which is blue light and entirely visible. Hey Midge, can you please stop, sweetie? Because I'm filming. Those are vastly different wavelengths and they have very different performance when cutting or engraving many materials. The most obvious example is transparent acrylic. Your typical hobbyist diode laser won't touch it. That makes sense, right? Remember, that's blue light because you can see through it, that means visible light passes through it. But it isn't transparent to the infrared light of a CO2 laser. Transparent acrylic will absorb that light, and so you can cut it just fine with a CO2 laser. You can also have the opposite problem. A blue diode laser will mark stainless steel as it causes oxidation and a color change, but stainless steel will reflect a CO2 laser without leaving a mark. Though you can get around that, which I'll explain later in this video. There are other factors than just reflection and transparency of the material to wavelengths, because even if the material absorbs the light, you may not get a clean cut if it melts more than burns. But I'm already worried this section of the video is boring, so I won't get into that. All of that to say that you wanna choose a laser best suited to the materials you wanna work with. There are also other laser types that are becoming more common in the hobbyist and prosumer markets, but I've already rambled enough. To try to simplify things, I will say that if you wanna work with a lot of acrylic, especially transparent, translucent, or light colored acrylic, you should probably get a CO2 laser. If you want to be able to mark stainless steel, you should probably get a diode laser, though there are better options for metal. Most other popular materials fall somewhere in between those two extremes and can be cut or engraved with either type of laser. Some will work better with one over the other, but you'll be able to cut or engrave wood, leather, paper, cork, fabric, and even stone with both of them. My personal opinion is that CO2 lasers are more useful to most hobbyists as acrylic is a fantastic and common material. Giving that up just to mark stainless steel doesn't make sense in most cases. 
But this isn't a sales pitch. I personally use both diode and CO2 lasers because they each have their place. Speaking of sales pitches, this is a good time for me to disclose that Monport gave me the Onyx for this review. However, they told me to be honest and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'll go over the features of this machine, telling you what I do and don't like along the way. Right off the bat, I can say that I think the Monport Onyx is a really nice looking machine. It isn't gaudy and it has a nice sturdy, well-built steel enclosure. It's also self-contained with the exception of the air filter. The cooling system for the CO2 laser tube is inside the enclosure, so you don't have to deal with an external pump and coolant tank. There is a glass lid on top to get to the work area, and it lifts on gas struts. You can see what you're working on and get to it easily, which is nice. The work sits on a honeycomb bed with a removable tray beneath it. That tray will inevitably collect little bits of material and dumping it out is really easy. If you're engraving really thick material, you can take out the tray and the honeycomb bed to get more room and Z beneath the laser. With the bed in place, it will fit material up to 15 millimeters thick. Without the bed, it will fit material up to 51 millimeters thick. Then there are my two favorite features, the camera and the autofocusing system. The camera is on the lid above the bed and points down at the work. Once calibrated, you can use that to position your designs on the material. I've come to really rely on cameras like this and think all laser machines should have them. They aren't a substitute for traditional positioning when you need precision, but they're great for quickly setting up a job when you have wiggle room. The reason the camera isn't good for precision is because of image warping and parallax error. The camera sensor is, practically speaking, a single point and is only accurate for the point on the material it's directly above. I use Lightburn and it does compensate for image warping, but that's never perfect and parallax makes it worse when thicker objects are near the edge of the bed. Here you can see that my actual cut is pretty close to the desired point when it was in the middle of the bed. But when I try to do the same in a corner, it's pretty far off. Even so, the camera is really useful for quickly plopping a design down onto the material when the position doesn't need to be perfect. The autofocus system is even more useful and really doesn't have any drawbacks. You simply move the laser above your material and push the autofocus button. Then the machine will physically touch off the material and set the proper autofocus height. Focus is really important because laser beams start spread out, converge on a point, and then spread back out again. You want that point, the focal point, to be on the surface of your material when engraving or roughly in the middle of your material when cutting. A lot of laser machines lack autofocus, which means you have to set the distance manually. That takes time and, depending on the mechanism, can be difficult to get right. So I really like that the Onyx has autofocus to take one more <laughs> hassle out of my life. The mirror system was also perfect on my machine from the factory. Because the laser tube is stationary in the back of the machine, CO2 lasers need a system of mirrors to direct the beam to the material. Each mirror's angle needs to be correct in order to get the beam where it's supposed to go. Anyone who has ever had to adjust those mirrors can tell you what a pain it is. Luckily, the Onyx's mirrors are mounted securely and aligned from the factory. I haven't had to touch mine, and I'm grateful for that. Moving on to the air evacuation and filtration systems, there are three distinct stages. The first is a small fan on the back of the Onyx's enclosure that pulls smoke out. The second is a pretty substantial blower in line along the duct, which pulls the air from the machine and pushes it through the duct. The third is the filtration unit, which has fans of its own to help get the air through the filters. That filtration unit is technically optional and it does cost extra, Instead of using it, you could route the duct out of a window and into your neighbor's house or something. But personally, I consider a filtration unit to be a requirement, and I use them on all of my laser machines. There isn't anything special about Monport's unit. I think it's actually the same as my Creality unit, just with a different control panel. So you can shop around if you want to try and find a cheaper alternative somewhere. Just keep in mind that the duct might not fit without the adapter that Monport provides. On the subject of air, the Onyx does have an air assist pump built into the enclosure. 
Air assist is practically a necessity, and like with the cooling system, it's awesome that you don't have to set up a separate external unit. The working area is 460 by 290 millimeters, which is about 19.2 by 11.4 inches. That's a pretty generous amount of space and really good for a desktop machine. But it also means that the Onyx is pretty big and heavy. It's more than three feet long and the specs say it weighs in at a hefty 135 pounds, which is more than an entire Taylor Swift if we take TMZ's word for it. Moving on to performance, well, it's a 55 watt CO2 laser and it performs like one. 55 watts is a very healthy figure and though there are certainly more powerful machines out there, I think this is more than enough for most use cases. I try to stay under 75% power when cutting, but even that still leaves plenty of grunt. The vast majority of the cutting I've done with the Onyx has been in acrylic, which is the whole reason I wanted it in addition to my diode laser machines. I've been making a lot of acrylic scions lately, and so this has been perfect. The Onyx burns through acrylic with ease and leaves nice clean edges. I've been cutting 1 8 inch acrylic sheets, but it can definitely do thicker than that. I wouldn't hesitate to cut half inch acrylic, which is crazy thick. I was also really interested in marking metal with the Onyx. I said earlier that blue diode lasers can mark stainless steel and CO2 lasers can't, but I was talking about raw, untreated material. What if we loosen those requirements a bit? If your metal is painted or powder coated, you can burn through that with the CO2 laser and get really nice results. You can also use special marking sprays that work with CO2 lasers. Monport sells their own spray and it's pretty easy to use. You just clean your part, coat the surface with the marking spray, almost like spray painting, let it dry for five to 10 minutes and then run your laser. The laser burns the coating into the metal, leaving nice dark lines. Afterwards, you rinse off the excess spray coating with water. At least that's how it's supposed to work. In my case, I had mixed success. I didn't have any stainless steel on hand, so I tried this with 6061 aluminum and mild steel. I started with some raw 6061 aluminum stock, and it looked good when I pulled it off the machine, but the markings mostly rubbed off when I washed the part in water. Then I tried mild steel, which worked very well, and the markings look great. They stick well and don't rub off at all. After verifying the ideal settings with Monport, I tried the 6061 aluminum again. I thought maybe a freshly machined surface would help, so I used a fly cutter on the aluminum. By the way, this fly cutter design is free for my patrons. After running the fly cutter across the surface, I cleaned it very thoroughly with acetone to make sure there wasn't any oil or residue, and that didn't work either. The markings, once again, mostly rubbed off. Then I read online that someone had success by taking multiple passes, so I tried one more time with three passes, and that didn't work well either. Therefore, my conclusion is that the marking spray will work for some materials and not others. It worked well on the mild steel, but not on the 6061 aluminum. Unfortunately, I didn't have any other metal to test it on. Maybe it'll work on material like brass or titanium, but I have no idea because I don't have either of those in my pile of scrap. Of course, there are many other materials you can work with aside from acrylic and metals. Wood is an obvious choice that works well. You can also do cork, leather, cardboard, many kinds of fabric, and several others. If you're new to working with lasers, I recommend simply Googling the material and its compatibility with different laser types. Some things are actually dangerous and may surprise you. For example, you shouldn't cut vinyl sheets or really any kind of vinyl. That's because vinyl is PVC and that C stands for chloride. Burning PVC with a laser produces chlorine gas, which is a chemical weapon banned even in war. So, you know, be careful. There are alternatives and even special forms of vinyl that are laser safe. Anyway, I think the Onyx is a great machine, but I'm betting what you really want to know is if it is a good value compared to the other options on the market, right? As of this writing, the Onyx is priced at $15.99. That makes it more affordable than similar machines from OM Tech, Atom Stack, Flux, Xtool, and Guayki. Is that how you say it? Guayki? 
Some of those, like the OMTech Polar Light, are only a little bit more expensive than the Onyx. Others, like the Xtool P2, are a lot more expensive. With the Onyx, you're getting a lot for the money, and I feel confident recommending it. But what if that $15.99 price tag is stretching your budget? Monport does offer some more affordable machines. I don't have any experience with the Reno series, but it's a bit cheaper. However, it lacks the camera and requires an external pump for the coolant. Then there's Monport's K40 series, which starts at just $469. If you aren't familiar, the K40 is a generic CO2 laser design sold by many different companies. They're all very similar, just with different paint jobs and slightly different provisions. My first laser machine was actually a generic K40, and I liked it a lot. The value is really, really good, and they're capable machines. Monport even has an upgraded option for 539 that includes a built-in air assist unit. And that's what I would recommend if you're on a tight budget and want a CO2 machine. That said, the Onyx is better in every way. The machine itself is only slightly bigger, but it has a much larger working area. Then there is the autofocus system, the integrated cooling system, and the camera. And though it's a lot harder to quantify, the motion system and overall construction of the Onyx are better than a K40. You can just tell it's a nicer model. The final thing I want to talk about is software, because that is incredibly important for any machine. Monport advertises two options for the Onyx, RDWorks and Lightburn. RDWorks is free and works with laser machines that have Ruida controllers, which the Onyx does. To be frank, I think RDWorks is awful and I don't think anyone should use it. I couldn't even get it working despite the Onyx's instructions being written specifically for RDWorks. Even regular users of RDWorks seem to hate it if the various forums and subreddits are anything to go by. And when I was trying to get it set up, the only thought going through my mind was Wow, this feels like it was programmed in 2002 by high schoolers doing a class assignment. Thankfully, you can use Lightburn, which is actually decent. I'm on record as not being the biggest fan of Lightburn, and I'll stick to that. I think its user interface is messy and clunkier than it needs to be. But it does work well and is very popular throughout the industry. However, you should know that you need to buy a license to use Lightburn after the free trial. And for the Onyx, you actually have to purchase the upgraded Pro license. That costs $200 or $100 to upgrade an existing Lightburn license. So you'll want to take that into account when making your decision because you almost certainly won't want to use RDWorks. The good news is that the Onyx is really easy to set up in Lightburn. With the machine connected through USB, Lightburn immediately recognized the Onyx and I was able to start cutting within a couple of minutes. The process to calibrate the camera in Lightburn does take a while, but that's true for all machines and isn't the fault of the Onyx. This video is getting pretty long and I think this is a good place to bring it to an end, but I'm sure there are things I missed, so feel free to ask questions in the comments. I'm usually pretty good about responding quickly. And if you do want to purchase a Monport Onyx or a K40, you can use my link in the video description, which helps support me and this channel. Thanks for watching.